So, I mean, the textbook of uh, debt monetization is when a central bank purchases T-bills and money supply follows it, and you're basically turning debt into, into, into money. Mm-hmm. Money supply, M2, is up at a 13% annual rate since they got involved in the market in September. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is textbook debt monetization. QE was a fancy term that Bernanke came up with to say we're going to buy long-term tr- assets, but it's not monetization because we're going to sell them when the economy gets better, and this is just a temporary purchase of long-term assets. They're doing, they announced the T-bill purchase, and I'm calling that T-bill purchase. I mean, that is just textbook. I mean, money and banking that I learned in the ni- early 1980s said that is monetization. If they stop this, we'll be right back to September right away. And if they, when they stopped it in 29, you had the crash. And when they stopped it in 2000, we had the crash. So where I am is I, I don't think they are, they are going to stop. The history of the world tells you they're not going to. Thanks for watching this RTD interview. Don't forget to pick up your RTD Scary George Round, only available at sdbullion.com. Now enjoy this interview. Welcome to Rethinking a Dollar. Today I'm excited to have first-time guest, Mr. Garrett Moran. He is joining us to share his thoughts on the global economy, financial markets, and a variety of other subject matter. And so, Garrett, welcome to Rethinking a Dollar. Thank you for having me, Mike. Well, I appreciate you taking time to uh, sit down with us here at Rethinking a Dollar. Definitely looking forward to getting your thoughts and analysis and assessment as to where we're at, where we're, ho- where we're going, and how people can protect, preserve, or just weather the storm that's underway. But before I dive into those questions, I'm curious to find out who exactly is Garrett Moran and how have you arrived at this point in your career? Um, I'm 57 years old. I started in the business in 1984 with Smith Barney as a retail stockbroker. My background is I, in college, I studied the Federal Reserve and money and banking. So I've been a, a Federal Reserve follower for my whole life and my whole career. Um, after leaving Smith Barney, I ran a macro hedge fund in the, in the eight, excuse me, in the 90s. Uh, I've been a precious metals commodity trader, run, run a second hedge fund. I have a consulting business in money management now. So it's my whole career has been involved with macroeconomics in the Federal Reserve. Sounds good. So definitely looking forward to getting your thoughts on it because you've been following it for some time now. And I'm sure you've witnessed the developments throughout the year. So we'll definitely get into that. But uh, first question for you. Um, we're currently approaching a new decade. We're a couple weeks away from 2020. There's a lot of activity happening right now. What concerns you the most and what are you keeping your eyes on? Um, I think we're in the third great credit bubble of my career. We had the dot-com bubble. We had the housing bubble. And now we have one that the Federal Reserve has intentionally inflated over the last decade. This one's going to be different, in my opinion, because I mean, let's face it, the Federal Reserve has never been as, as involved in the financial markets as they are today. So nobody really knows how this whole thing is going to play out. But what we do know is this is not the same financial markets that I started in 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And we're, we're approaching something that's totally different from anybody's ever seen, probably in the history of the world. Yeah, I would agree. And so we're approaching something that's never been seen before. Highlight a couple of things that stands out the most that you've witnessed uh, the change, the change wise over the last 20 or 30 years of your career that is just completely unimaginable. Well, so let's go back to the dot-com bubble. The dot-com bubble, the Federal Reserve kept interest rates too low for too long. We had a great innovation in the internet, and there's a lot of speculation that came around in that, in that cycle. But it'd be, it'd be hard to say that the Federal Reserve intentionally drove internet stocks higher. They were probably more complicit in allowing it to happen. The, then we had the, the crash, and they reinflated the housing bubble. And yes, they're probably more implicitly involved in keeping mortgage rates too low and they saw the housing bubble. And now, now this one, what's just absolutely crazy is one year ago, Jerome Powell was saying, you know, we're gonna, mon- we're gonna normalize monetary policy. The market started coming apart. And now in September, we had this repo spike 
and things started happening, and the Federal Reserve has acted like we're in an emergency and a crisis right now. And here we have a stock market that goes up every day. And you just have to, it's, so we're, instead of mopping up the bubbles, now they're saying, hey, we're not gonna let this thing come apart. And they've extended their balance sheet like we've never seen during a good economy, supposedly. And the question is, how, do, how does the whole thing play out? So that's what, what concerns me, is we are in an unprecedented situation where stock and bond prices are selling the highest valuations in history, and the Federal Reserve is trying to push them even higher. Yeah. Sorry. And so it's, it's Jerome Powell's been very adamant in saying that keeping this expansion going is probably a new mandate. And so he talks about, you know, maximum exactly. employment, maximum or whatever, whatever. And so it looks like the third mandate that he's issued himself or that has been inst you know, instructed to, to keep going is that expansion. And so we've been in a 10 plus year, the longest expansion. And so that is a distortion in of itself. What's the, what's the likelihood of this expansion continuing on being driven by the Fed and this not QE situation is underway? Um, okay, so from a, an Austrian macro player, you, you have to differentiate the real economy from the credit cycle. So there's no and if or buts that the Fed is extending the credit cycle. Look at junk bond, bond spreads, extraordinarily tight. Um, you know, over the weekend, I tweeted out that the, the Federal Reserve's Z1 shows it credit expansion has been $3.2 trillion a year for the last two years. So that's, you know, a trillion and a half dollars worth of treasuries, corporates and all. The, the U.S. economy is now, it needs about three, three let's say $3.2 trillion in credit expansion to get $800 billion in nominal GDP growth. So as long as the credit continues to expand, you're not going to get the the dot-com crash or the housing crash or this deflation that everybody's prepared for. And so can the Fed extend the credit cycle? Absolutely. No and if or buts. I think anybody who's arguing with that is probably losing money being short the stock market. So the Fed can continue the expansion, the credit expansion. Now, can, is this helping the real economy at all? Well, yeah, you know, we're seeing cracks. Industrial production was reported today down 0.8% year over year. Well, that's certainly not a strong expansion. Um, you know, there's how um, autos are a little weak. We've had some weak retail sales. So to me, I think what they can do is keep us from having the crash like we saw in 2001 or 2008. And so now well, what is what is this going to be? I mean, my best guess is we're probably looking at some type of stagflation where commodity prices bottom out. Um, does the dollar fall, well, against the yen, which is an awful currency, or the euro? So there's really like no alternative that you can move from the dollar. So I guess if, if we keep pushing this thing, we can get some type of stagflation or stagnation mm. without having the, the depression or deflation that so many people are worried about. Right. So stagflation referring to you mentioning commodities prices going down or staying stagnant. And then I'm assuming the current assets is already heavily inflated, such as housing, equities markets. Will those continue to rally as well? So those are rally. And then the more realistic, tangible assets that are have been suppressed will probably go further, uh, further down in price or. or well, I, no, I mean, I think that, I mean, it's from a, for, for long term investments, that's one thing versus a trader. So I'm a trader and an investor. Oh, I th absolutely think that traders should be looking very hard at the commodity markets. And I'm seeing it in the charts. Coppers and oils are starting to form and may, may start rising. Uh, some, of the, you know, some of the emerging market currencies are starting to look better. Um, if you follow me at all, you obviously believe that I, I'm a huge precious metals bull because that is the currency that is going to, that people will move to. I mean, it's, you know, Let's face it, do you want a negative yielding yen, a negative yielding euro to replace your dollars with? <laughs> okay. So I, you know, we're seeing demand come at for gold picking up out of Eurasian central banks. Um, I do believe that there'll be some type of move from the non-Western countries towards using precious metals to settle transactions and settle trade deficits and things like that. So I, 
I do believe that all investors should have an allocation to precious metals. And that's, that's the one thing that I'm, it's clear to me. Everything else is unclear. And you ask me, can the stock market keep going up? I'm a professional short seller, okay? I have zero short positions. I want to fight this thing. I want to bet my own money that the stock market's going to fall. Now, do, do, does that mean I want to invest in one of the highest valued stock markets in the history? Well, I don't have to do that either. So um, I could see the stock market keep going up and I could see it turning around and selling off. But my, my gut feeling is... Twice in American history, yeah, I say this is not really totally like 1999, but there is a little bit. I think if you recall in 1999, we had the Federal Reserve got all worried about Y2K and flooded the system with money, and the market took off from the second half of 1999, and when the Fed actually tried to pull the money back out, the liquidity back out in March, the market did have that topped out and fell. So... If the Fed, and then I don't know, most people don't understand this, but 1927, the Fed did the same thing. They intentionally juiced the stock market up. Stock market doubled. Early 1929, they started bringing liquidity out. And we had the, that famous crash later on that year. Mm-hmm. So in my opinion, where we are is if the Fed ever actually tries to get pull all this liquidity out, I will put some shorts on. Now, do you see them? Okay, so now we're, we're approaching 2020. So we're a couple of weeks away. And so it looks like there was no activity last week as far as them adjusting the rates or whatnot. So it looks like they're just trying to finish this year off with having as little problems as possible. But yet, I saw uh, some stuff about the repo activity. So they're inject they're as you mentioned, they're injecting the most imaginable and it's not QE. And so if this is just normal activity that they're doing to provide liquidity for the banks into Q4, payroll, all the things that they're trying to spin out. And it sounds like this is actually an emergency situation that you mentioned. Heading into 2020, what are you expecting them to continue to do? Ramp it up even more or just continue on? Because at some point they have to make an announcement because it's only so much you can say before people start panicking and believing that this is really QE. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm not a uh, not QE person. Uh, mm-hmm follow my tweets at all. I've been calling it flat out monetization. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, I mean, the textbook of uh, debt monetization is when a central bank purchases T-bills and money supply follows it. And you're basically turning debt into, into, into money, into money supply. Mm-hmm. That is happening. Mm-hmm. Money supply M2 is up at a 13% annual rate since they got involved in the market in September. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is textbook debt monetization. Mm-hmm. QE was a fancy term that Bernanke came up with to say we're going to buy long-term tr- assets, but it's not monetization because we're going to sell them when the economy gets better, and this is just a temporary purchase of long-term assets. Mm-hmm. They're doing. They announced the T-bill purchase, and I'm calling that T-bill purchase. I mean, that is just textbook. I mean, money and banking that I learned in the ni- early 1980s said that is monetization. Mm-hmm. So nobody's asked them. Congress didn't ask them. They had no press conference. Um, and you already heard what I said. If they stop this, we'll be right back to September right away. And if they, when they stopped it in 29, you had the crash. And when they stopped it in, a, in 2001 or 2000, we had the crash. So where I am is I, I don't think they are, they are going to stop. The history of the world tells you they're not going to stop. We're past anything we've done in the United States before. Yeah. Now, if we're they talking do talking about John Law, we're now talking about the Mississippi bubble. We're now talking about Weimar Germany. But those are all different situations, too, because you didn't have the global central bank coordination that you have now. So, yeah, we're in an unprecedented situation. I do. The only recommendation I have is having a position in precious metals equities. Prudently, you should only be long, you know, five or 10 percent. Personally, I'm long 100 percent. But <laughs> Now, Garrick. Now, nothing good lasts forever. And so you've given us you've given us two time periods where they pull back providing liquidity and we know what happened from that point, but as you mentioned the central banking was not all interconnected. So this next time that they are you know so they may, so they're not going to be forced to pull back because I think they're, they're attempting to protect themselves and preserve themselves first by keeping this thing going. Right. But if something does happen, do you see it coming from the Eastern ally, Eastern nations, as you mentioned earlier, them bringing gold and silver back into the play to where 
uh, the world shifts directly and the Fed has to adjust to the new role of them not having the reserve currency anymore? Or how will this come to an end? Because it cannot go on forever. Um, okay, so what the, the interesting thing I saw last week was both the ECB and the Fed said that they are not going to raise rates. And the Fed said until we push inflation through two, two and a half percent, and it stays there and above that. So they've already told you that they're going to they're gonna keep doing what they're doing until inflation actually picks up. Mm. Start talking about heat. And are you familiar with hedonistic accounting of inflation? No, nope. give it to us. Give it to us. Give us the give steak, us. Steak prices go up. We switch to hamburger meat. Mm. Uh, you, car prices have not gone up in the last 20 years because the quality keeps getting better. They, it, healthcare, they have, the, the government has healthcare, PCE healthcare prices rising 1% to 2%. We all know in the real world that number is more like 5 or 10%. Mm. Here's a Fed that told you they're not going to raise rates until inflation goes through 2 2.5% and stays there, yet they're using an accounting that keeps it, inflation below that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, no, but what not. I'm trying to say is they are going to keep pushing the current policy until inflation actually picks up and everybody sees it. And how are they going to see it? They're going to see gasoline prices starting to rise. They're going to see, I mean, we're all, everybody's already seen the healthcare prices going through the roof, but nobody talks about it. Mm, now, with those prices that are going up, it, it'll be hard. I'm sure it's possible. It's going to be hard for those some commodities in the form of true money, gold and silver and copper and all those other things to also be reflected in the nominal price uh, as well. So do you see them continuing to attempt their very best to, to utilize the futures, the COMEX and all those mechanisms they've created to suppress the true nature and true price of gold and silver? Do you see them being able to continue that on in the midst of all of these prices around us going up? Thanks for watching this interview. If you're enjoying content like this, feel free to become a part of the RTD community by becoming a member via Patreon. All it takes is a monthly contribution of about $5 a month for more great content such as this. Just scroll down beneath this video here and click the Patreon link and then hit this tab right here to become a member of the team. Looking forward to bringing you more great content. Now, let's get back to this interview. Thanks. So, as far as the suppression goes, you know, Nixon took us off the gold standard in 71 when gold was at $35. So their suppression, it works over periods of times, and then they run out of physical supply, and then the price starts moving up again. But, 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 but when the thing, but from just my little two cents, when the price is, ba is, is based, engaged upon all the futures and all the digital illusions of them being able to just dump the markets with contracts or whatnot, What's the likelihood that they can continue that on, just creating more paper paper claims? So I was trading gold from from night from two thousand one, and I'm I'm trading gold today. Okay, gold went from three hundred dollars to nineteen hundred dollars, and I'll promise you, there's plenty of times when I was asleep and the price of gold fell fifty dollars, you know, at three o'clock in the morning on on thousands of contracts. So my my point is, in a bear market, they have a lot better control of dumping the gold and having it actually work than if gold. So gold was went from 300 to 1900 and these same activities were occurring. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I, I'm not in the camp that they can control the price of gold or oil when demand actually outstrips supply and the inventories. When, once you get into a point where the inventories and deliveries have to happen. So, now, when that comes about, because there will come a day, I, I, I believe that as well, what do you think, based upon the activity, the repo activity, all this additional liquidity, the monetary base continuing to go up, you know, what do you think just the bare minimum price of an ounce of gold should be in this next decade and then before it actually takes off and probably reaches the numbers that we probably can't fathom at this current moment? I think what you just said is correct. The prices that we can't fathom. Mm, interesting. It's just I don't. Again, I, I, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is this is okay. I've, again, I've studied the history of the world monetarily. I follow the Fed my whole career. This is the exact polar opposite of 1980 when I started in the business. In 1981, we had the Federal Reserve started targeting money supply, allowed interest rates to float. Gold peaked out at 875 and went nowhere for 20 years. We had this rip-roaring bond market. 
we're the exact opposite. The Fed is now targeting financial assets and allowing money supply to, fo to float. And if you study the history of the world, psychologically, central bankers can get in their head they're doing the right thing. When you go back, and again, I'm not going to call this Weimar Germany because the de there was alternative currencies from the DMARC that you could leave the DMARC and go to the dollar, you can, you can go to the pound, you can go to these other things. There is no alternative fiat currency right now. So this is not going to be a U.S. dollar collapsing. But so historically, when it starts, if the Fed gets ingrained in their head that inflation picks up through that two and a half, three percent thing, and they say, oh, my God, if we tighten right now, we're, we're going to blow up the financial system. And that means Social Security checks aren't going out. Mm. And they start thinking we might be doing a better job by just go ahead and keep supporting financial assets and never pulling that Band-Aid off. And as that works, you get the, you know, it, you start getting your spike. Mm -hmm. And now the question, yes, I mean, the question psychologically, how far will, how far will go? And the history of the world tells us once the central bankers do this, they don't stop. So they're going to go until the they're very end. Until and then there's going to be something else. Now, amongst all that, we're not the only nation on the planet that's having issues with our monetary system as well as a, just a, the lifeline of the economy itself. And so let's talk about our Eastern partners, allies, or whatnot. We have Russia, China. They're heavily involved in a lot of activity. We have the Belt and Road Initiative, which I believe is a, going to be a part of the, it's going to be leading the way in this next decade beyond. And then they will definitely not want Federal Reserve notes as their primary medium of exchange. So they're going to right. be doing some things amongst themselves. Do you think about that much? And, and how serious yeah. of a threat will that be in this next decade? I think that's why the Eurasian central banks are buying gold right now. I mean, Turkey, Romania, Poland, uh, Serbia, they're all, they're all buying gold. Why? Because they're going to use gold to settle their trade for, for the Belt and Road Initiative you're talking about. I think, I think gold will be the, the currency. The yuan can't, you know, people say, well, the yuan's going to surpass gold. The yuan by itself cannot, okay? They have their own issues. They have their own debt issues. But if you start talking about using, you know, having trade de deficits and other deficits settle with, you know, let's say a crypto-backed gold currency between central bankers, boom, you now have a new monetary system overnight. Now, what's the likelihood that uh, the United States would just sit by and let that happen? Well, you know, they, they typically well, don't like to give World up. Are you talking about World War III? I don't like to use that word on this channel here, sir. So. <laughs> but no, I mean, that's one I thing either. I do fear. I have, four, I have four boys. I don't want... I mean, the, the, that's the scary. The scary part is historically when you the, the, the if if this is a rising power versus a falling power situation, historically it does end up in war. And that you know, let's you know pray that the, as I said, I have four boys. I hope not that does not happen. Uh, but historically, countries do not give up easily. Right now, and, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I mean, I'm just saying that's the history of the world says they don't they don't give up easily. Interesting. Now, uh, one of the things that's becoming more uh, mainstream news now is that there's a push. And so after this past Jackson Hole, Mark Carney referenced that the need for nations to begin looking away or diversifying, or as I call it here on this channel, de-dollarizing their economies. And they are looking to utilize the blockchain, the digital tokens aspect of things. So we have central bank digital currencies is being mentioned now. France is rolling one out. China already has one. Russia has been working on one. Venezuela has one. And so it looks like prior to this shift, they're preparing themselves by setting up an alternative monetary system within their own country. So what do you think this is heading to? And will this become the, the gateway before there's an actual monetary shift of power? Let's hope, I, let's hope that's how it works. It just gradually moves to a different settlement system. And you know, as I've already stated, it's my it's my investment thesis that it's coming, and it has to come. I mean, it, once again, the history. I, I I keep going back to psychology and history. When the biggest problem with the dollar is, I mean, again, look at what we just did with the repos. Okay, so the Fed was doing QT, withdrawing liquidity from the system. When it blew up uh, the Argentine peso, nobody cared. If it blew up the Turkish lira, nobody cared. If it hurt, if we hurt China with what we're doing, nobody cared. But 30 seconds into repo rate spiking, the Fed switches massively. So the Fed, 
by their actions repeatedly says, I'm going to protect Wall Street. I'm going to protect our financial markets. And so historically, the psychology, the people who are not benefiting from that, either whether you're a U.S. investor, I mean, once again, I go back to Weimar, Germany, the farmers stopped sending their crops into the city. They said, I'm not going to take your currency anymore. I'm going to sit on my crops. Foreigners rejected the currency and moved on. So psychologically, people who are not benefiting from the support of our repo market are sitting back going, really? Here you go again? And let's, let's face it, foreign, foreign central banks stopped buying U.S. Treasuries during QE. It was around QE 1 or 2 whenever, when foreign, foreign central banks stopped putting Treasuries in reserves and started building their gold reserves. So this decision is already in their head. They're, now, do you announce it and face the wrath of the U.S. military, possibly? Or do you just do it slowly and gradually and keep moving on? And I think it's, I think it's more of the, you know, the frog in the pot situation, that our Fed's going to conti continue to support our financial markets. Money supply is going to expand. Foreigners are going to continue to try to see how they can bring gold back into the monetary system. And the first thing you do is you go out and you buy gold and you put it in your reserves. And now you can have it in your monetary system. Mm, I think, I'm, so I'm in the camp that what's going on right now is just is the beginning of this whole thing. And and I know I do I do I have no interest in betting on a stock market crash because I think the Fed is going to I think they've already made it. I've, I mean, how much clearer can you be? Mm. What they've done with the with supporting the repo market, saying they'll allow inflation to go through two and a half percent, and that's their their they're on the game plan. Game plan is to support the financial market, support treasury, make sure social security checks go out and allow inflation to gradually rise and foreigners are going to move away from the dollar. Yeah. Now, I'm curious to get your thoughts because you're, you're in the market, you're uh, an active advisor and financial gentleman yourself. So for the millions of people in this country that are very passive with their investing, they prefer to just turn it over to somebody else and it's more computerized trading these days when it comes to all those uh, 401ks and retirement vehicles. What are your thoughts as, as, as you head into this next, next decade, the risk, the risk of some type of contagion event causing some type of market meltdown, financial correction, where the Fed has to really be, get involved. What are your thoughts on the long-term aspects of all these products that have been given to the American public in digital form, pensions, all that stuff like that? Um, okay, so we have the, once obviously yes, I'm trying to build a business in money management. I have a, I have an RIA, but I'm still really trading for a living. Uh, as investment advice, it's so obvious that you know we're we're dealing with the lowest interest rates in the history of mankind. So the concept that you can make a a long term return in treasuries and and bond, we've had records amounts of money go into bond funds, and over the last multiple years and especially in the last year uh there's been a huge buildup in money market funds and, and so my gut my gut feeling is the overweighting in bonds and fixed income is going to get eroded by by inflation so that's going to prove to be looking at so i like to as far as an allocation goes america is long the stock market and long the bond market like it's never been before. We have financial assets selling at the highest valuations versus GDP in history. And we have a Fed that is trying to support that. So, I mean, realistically, looking at, I mean, John Hussman does fantastic work on valuations and all. Mm -hmm. Realistically, believing that you're gonna get the same returns out of stock and bond market going forward is crazy. So, I mean, the only thing, I'm, the, what I'm trying to tell people is having a five to 10% investment in precious metals or precious metals equities and, you know you look at you go back and look at the 70s maybe the set maybe the best we can do is the 70s so in the 70s you lost if you had a bond in stock portfolio you lost 65 percent of your purchasing power mm -hmm. even the, you know even it went sideways for 15 years but you lost 65 70 percent if you put a five or ten percent allocation in precious metals equities in your portfolio in 1970 that went up a thousand percent you're now you're now doing fine. So one thing that's very, very not, very not understood by the traditional money management community is the traditional, the average American has 
I think 0.6% of the money in precious metals. Mm -hmm. The average, you go to the, you go to the average RIA in, in Atlanta where I'm, I am and say, hey, I want to own some precious metals. They'll laugh at you. Say, well, why do you need to do that? Your bond and stock portfolios have done fine. So I'm just saying, you know, yeah, listen to the average RIA out there for 90% of your money, but five or 10 or 15%, you better, you know, care about yourself because 90% of the RIA is out there and are not, have no clue about what you and I are talking about right now. Mm. But, Interesting. Well, Garrick Moran, it has been great having you join us here on Rethinking a Dollar. Looking forward to having you back on in 2020, and we'll see where we're at and get more of your assessment at that point. But once again, thanks for joining us here on Rethinking a Dollar. All right. Happy holidays and, um, and a happy new year to you. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you.